All right. Hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Rob, Rob Wally. I'm uh, an engineer with uh, OpenGear. I started off as a uh, firmware developer um, down in the Australian office, the Brisbane office, uh, eight years ago. But the last four years I've been over in the UK uh, doing more kind of sales, business development kind of stuff. So kind of crossed over to the dark side a little bit. Um, but more recently I'm trying to redeem myself, getting more back involved with product development, kind of feeding uh, you know, requirements into product management uh, from the user's perspective now. I'm pretty intimately familiar with that. So just to, I guess, recap a little bit what we do and why. We provide remote management solutions that are appliance-sized as smart appliances, like the uh, resilience gateway we've just uh, introduced. So really, at their core, they're providing uh, troubleshooting and rem remediation services at the, um, from network outages. Uh, alongside all the critical infrastructure that they're actually managing. Um, so for example, you might be, say, an MSSP uh, managing customer premise firewalls. Uh, you're pushing out policies all the time. You fat finger, you lock yourself out. You've got a, a backup path to go and remediate that issue. Um, so what we're talking about now with this failover to cellular uh, component to our solution is actually not just allowing our users to remediate problems and fix them, but to actually survive network outages. Um, so we introduced uh, Failover to Cellular as a free feature upgrade in January this year, uh, and now we've actually built a product that's purpose-built uh, for this, uh, this feature. So you're going to have to excuse me at this point because I may be telling you what you already know in terms of, uh, in terms of the basics, but I guess for those playing at home, um, it's, I find it, it's good to start right at the start. So, really, we're providing at the core a miniaturized terminal server. So we have four console ports, serial uh, serial console for RJ45 RS232 connections to your network infrastructure. We also support USB consoles and Ethernet uh, management ports as well. So really, this is uh, giving you the same kind of uh, low-level control over the full life cycle of the device you're managing as if you're physically stood next to it with a console cable into your laptop, except where we have a, a persistent connection uh, that we're serving over the network. Um, so this kind of level of out-of-band, uh, I guess, could be uh, referred to as traditional out-of-band. So I'm starting to build out this network diagram, eventually getting to what we're going to demo. So really, what we're talking about here is the RS-232 uh, connections, um, maybe at a small remote land. So it might be a branch office, might be a wiring closet, uh, or a retail store, as we're talking about. Uh, so in your knock, you've got skilled hands. They can come in over your primary land connection and, and manage your, uh, your remote kit. However, if you've lost your WAN, you obviously can't do that. So the console server, uh, the traditional out-of-band element takes care of LAN resilience, but not necessarily WAN resilience. So we need built-in remote access. Uh, so really, we're talking about a separate box with a separate data path built in. So it's completely independent of your in-band network infrastructure. Um, so really, I guess if you're talking about our reference remote LAN, that would have been traditionally served by a PSTN dial-in line, but in the Day of voice over IP, um, COP is becoming increasingly scarce. So, you know, AT and T, I believe, um, they're going to complete their IP transition by 2020 and no longer maintain their COPTA network. Uh, so you, you won't be able to get COPTA for uh, love nor money. Uh, what we're finding is cellular wireless has emerged as a best fit technology to serve uh, remote management. Uh, there's a few reasons for this. Uh, one is it's more resilient to things like damage, physical cable damage and cable theft. Uh, so over in the UK there was a, uh, a small village where the entire high street was completely cut off. All their point of sale equipment was cut off when some guys came in and basically nicked all the cables up, up the street. So British Telecom uh, came in a couple of weeks later, replaced all the cables, they're all back, uh, back up and running again. The same set of thieves came in the next day and pinched them all again. So with cellular wireless, you're not vulnerable to that kind of thing. Uh, another one is the, I guess that kind of speaks to the, um, the, the time to provision. So really with cellular, provisioning a, a remote management connection is just as simple as putting a SIM and dropping the box in to a remote network. I mean, we even have uh, a bunch of our customers uh, use these as kind of 
the remote, uh, virtual remote technicians, they'll parachute by courier into the, net, uh, the remote network. They'll provision them on their bench, send them off uh, via courier, and just get some unskilled hands to plug in power, console, VPN back into their remote, uh, into their NOC, and then they'll uh, do all the, the, uh, the level two stuff from there. So, the third one is the, um, the performance, obviously. So, when you're dealing with 9600 board consoles, it might not seem like uh, such, a, uh, such an issue, but really um, having, having uh, 10, 20, 50, 100 megabits rather than 56K dial in makes a huge difference, uh, especially if you're in panic mode trying to get something fixed up in a hurry. So, now uh, starting or continuing to build out our uh, network diagram. We've got this backup uh, remote management connection, um, dormant management connection shown by the dotted line there, and that's allowing us to do remote remediation. Um, so, really, in this little box, you've got end to end out of band. You've got a, um, a separate WAN connection, and then you've got the uh, out of band connections to the consoles as well. So, we've just introduced the failover to cellular. Uh, a feature that, we've, um, that, that we're talking about today. Uh, but really, I guess it's a blanket term for a few fundamental concepts. Um, so one, as um, Ashirish has said, is IP pass through. That's kind of the, the foundation solution. That is effectively making our box a transparent path bridge uh, by which you connect the secondary ethernet into your uh, router's uh, secondary WAN port. Um, and it just comes up as a normal DHCP connection, so completely transparent. The failover logic, as we said, is all downstream in the um, in the router, uh, including, as we said, like kind of quality of service and those kind of things. We expect their handle handleware by the device that's most specialised for that kind of thing, which is the downstream router. Um, so we're not just doing IP pass through, as uh, Shirish has mentioned. We also have this concept of service intercepts. So we can continue to um, allow our, uh, uh, our smart out-of-band feature set to be available even in a uh, failover uh, situation. So that's uh, showing a, a failover occurring and service intercepts. And the modern turn is just sending you know, ping packets out from your ISP, goes down and just nail up the computer. Yeah, that's right. So I'll show you how I've got it configured in a minute. Um, so I'm just using a Cisco with IP SLAs to me out to Google's DNS. So. Um, so really this is giving you remote access to troubleshoot the fault uh, while the fault is ongoing and um, also letting the LAN route out to the, to the uh, internet while the fault is being remediated. So um, really, I, I guess if you've... Uh, if you're doing something like you're this MSSP that's pushed out a bogus firewall policy, um, one one uh, of our customers came up to me at the Cisco show we did in Milan uh, and said he loves our products because it means he can have a few beers on Friday night if he gets that pager or he gets that urgent SMS um, or call from his from his boss. It doesn't matter; he can go in with confidence and not worry about locking himself out. And. So now we've got our uh, reference network is built out uh, with Fallow to Cellular and Smart Out of Band in place. And that means we can start talking about the demo. So I've printed out a, uh, a, a large version here for reference, but this is a real network. It's uh, in my home office in Cambridge, UK, so it is um, properly remote. It's uh, 5,500 miles away, so nearly 9,000 kilometres. So we're kind of putting our money where our mouth is um, in terms of remote management, and I'm confident that everything will go exactly to plan. Have you had enough beers to start? With the <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's right. Um, so this room is the knock uh, TFD Tech Field Day, um, and in terms of the the WAN link, I'm actually just going through a an intermediary switch so I can force a WAN value by, by shutting down the port. Pretty brutal outage. Um, from a network config perspective, this is how it's configured. I've got a couple of service intercepts. Um, I'm just using an off-the-shelf SIM uh, from a three uh, carrier cellular carrier in uh, in the UK. So I'm just getting a dynamic address. I'm using DynDNS. Um, yep, not much more to say about that. 
and uh, first we'll uh, have a look how it's configured and we'll get to the console so I can show you how that all works. So uh, this is the um, uh, this is the I, uh, sorry the F2C demo system that I'm uh, logging into now. Uh, I set up a service intercept for its web UI, I have HTTPS, and also its uh, SSH service. So I'll just log into the uh, web UI and give you guys a look. So I've already got this all configured up and connected to the cellular network, and indeed I'm coming in over the cellular connection right now. So when you first log into the Open Gear, uh, the resolution isn't super crash hot through the projector, but you get a, um, I guess, a 500 foot overview of the network. Everything is being monitored, as we mentioned. We won't go into a whole bunch of detail, but you can do things like environmental monitoring. We've got like this uh, graph here. Um, you can do power, uh, the backup power monitoring and PU control all through the one little box. Uh, I've got a cellular connection configured up. I haven't got the greatest signal strength at the moment, but um, we've got couple of antennas here for um, diversity, so it, it'll suffice, and we're, we're all up and connected. So, just show you real quickly, in terms of the cellular configuration, it's literally just kind of check this radio button, put in an APN, and that's how you configure up the cellular. In terms of IP pass-through, so again, checkbox. Uh, select the, uh, the cellular modem, in this case we've only got the one uh, in the device um, to pass from, and then the Ethernet port to pass through. So this is where we start with the HTTP server. Uh, one kind of little gotcha that we've hit is um, the, uh, the cellular connection is uh, more often than not just a point-to-point -point link, so we won't actually have a net mask. The uh, internal logic of the cellular chipset will sometimes invent one um, that isn't isn't, doesn't fall on like a classless boundary or doesn't uh, work with the gateway. Um, so the downstream router will, will reject it. So if you've got this little option here to force the subnet mask and override it for DSTP. Uh, so we've spoken to say Verizon SEs and they just say, yep, that's normal, that's how IP pass through operates. Uh, just give it a plus C and we'll, we'll sort it out. Uh, in terms of the service intercepts, again, checkbox, and you can assign them a port. So if I still want to get to the, uh, the downstream um, uh, router, the ISR on port 22, I can, because I'm only going to intercept uh, 8022. So all of the cellular network settings is, is literally deconfigured from our interface and passed through. So we're only going to be able to be responsive on these ports when we're in FTC mode. So next I'll show you how I've got the router configured. Um, and just a heads up, I'm not a Cisco engineer, I know just enough to be dangerous, but I'll show you, show you what I've done. So, in terms of the configuration, uh, pretty straightforward, there's a couple of things to note. One is uh, we're tracking an IPS delay that I've configured. I've uh, put in a little uh, up and down delay just so I'm not flapping. So you know, it takes a few failed things before I actually fail over and fail back. Um, and the IPS delay itself, that's how I've got it configured. As I said, just pinging Google's DNS server. Um, so that's about all there is to it in terms of configuration. It's quite straightforward. Um, we can have a look at Yep. So we're currently on our um, routing through our WAN, through our, our primary Ethernet. So we're going out this way. So as I said, uh, this is a uh, remote demo. Uh, I wasn't uh, particularly thrilled, or I didn't, I didn't particularly want to plug my entire demo network over here um, in my, my check baggage. So I had to kind of figure out a way, how can I show that this thing is actually failing over and failing back. So to do that, I've set up a, um, a VM out in the cloud, um, and I've uh, pulled that machine that goes ping, and essentially that's just telling you who's pinging it and from which source it is. So I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so what I'm, what I'm um, wanting to demo is that this LAN client maintains connectivity during a failover and failback um, uh, situation. Yep. So the second part is, as we said, we've got uh, some smart out-of-band features. So we've got some automation built into the product um, that allows us to do more than just uh, 
serve consoles or even do IP pass through. So I've got some, uh, some auto responses set up to send some alerts directly to me on my phone and also uh, to tweet. Okay, so first I'll show you uh, the machine that goes to ping. So this is, this is our uh, cloud service essentially that the LAN client is trying to reach. So it's literally a Python app with monkey Python. Yeah. So um, what we can do is ping it. So there we go. That's uh, I'm pinging from my laptop here on the uh, the Cisco wireless network. Uh, if you guys are welcome to to ping, it should work. <laughs> it's forty six dot twenty dot one two one dot one zero three. Um, Come on, everybody's got to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you might even tweet it out. Up, actually. <laughs> tweet it out and see if you can get all of Cisco Live <laughs> Yeah, then we nice. really get the app. So we're all on the same network, so I guess it's uh, about all we can see. Uh, no? <laughs> That's definitely not going to get annoying. <laughs> so at some point, I'm probably going to ask, have to ask you to stop. <laughs> we're, we're all <laughs> Now 
SMS. And in a moment. I'm going to turn it off now. <laughs> and this is totally Twitter being slow, not me. So, there you go. We are back on our primary connection. So, maintain connectivity. There was a short outage of maybe like five seconds um, while we failed over the cellular and then back up and running it. So, um, very quickly before I uh, pass back to to Shirish, I'll show you um, the configuration of uh, those automated actions. So that's our auto response framework. Can you talk just a little bit more about the service center steps and how they work? Yeah, sure. So essentially, uh, they're just firewall rules that when uh, traffic comes in on those ports, they're redirected to the loopback connection. So you can SSH and, and uh, even though you don't have an IP address configured on, on your um, WAN0, you know, your cellular interface. Okay. So uh, by de de default, um, we're supporting our management services of, um, of it's funny, it, I've had this running just as kind of like a demo um, in the background, um, and just every so often, you just get <laughs> um, So yeah, so, so literally, you, you can uh, choose to, to intercept it on a, a separate port if you don't want to, if you don't want to run. Intercept kind of your uh, the the traffic to the downstream route, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but essentially, it's done through like tables. Yeah. Um, so I was going to show you a response really quick. Uh, so this is basically the framework through which we implement smart out of band. So this is where we bring all these inputs together in terms of our um, digital I/O monitoring, um, our power monitoring. Um, our can even monitor cable connectivity, so we can monitor se uh, serial signals. So, shall we pass it as well? So, I'll show you what just did the magic. Um, so, this is an auto response. As I said, you've got a whole bunch of uh, different check conditions. So, it could be environmental, uh, it could be, uh, say, a digital I/O. So, we've got some built-in uh, open voice sensors, so that could be hooked up to say a water leak detector, smoke alarm, something like that. Uh, UPS, so we support, as uh, Shirish said, over 100 different vendors' UPS systems. So we can have, say, a USB connection to a UPS and we can detect when it goes to the line power, uh, the battery power, and send alarms or do load shedding, things like that. Uh, the one that I'm using, I was using for the demo, was a serial pattern match that could be like a regular expression or just a, a simple string to match on. Um, so I'm just saying, when I see reachability up to down on my ISR console, I'll, uh, I'll take an automated action. So in this case, the one of the actions is, was like a built-in uh, send an SMS alarm, um, but you can also do something like send an email, uh, it might be to like a trouble ticketing system or something like that, you can raise like a ticket, um, you can send SMP traps, something back, you know, like SolarWinds or something like that, or Nagios, we've got an uh, NSCA and an RPE, so you can integrate with Nagios. Um, or even do an RPC action, which is kind of RPC is like a PDU or an IPMI based on something that controls power. Uh, so you can automatically cycle an outlet. Um, the other kind of cool thing is you can have uh, escalating actions. So at minute zero, you might send an SMMP trap to your NMS. Uh, minute 15, you might start spamming people with, S uh, with uh, SMSs. And then uh, if the situation is still ongoing after half an hour, then you can just start bouncing equipment to try and recover the, uh, uh, the remote network automatically. Um, the other thing you can do is you can plug in your own custom scripts. So uh, here's one that I've... Yeah. Uh, developed uh, that basically just sends the tweet. So that's what, that's what did the, the tweet. So, um, were there any other questions or anything else you want to see in terms of... I have a more general question. Yep. And it's more around the voice APIs. A lot of, you know, network voices now, modern APIs, they make a rest call to the device and the show command, get, get a response back. Yep. And, you know, is there any like that on open your spot or in the future in terms of, you know, an API call slash device name slash commands, be the console port, serial port, Go and get the data and then we'll get something in front of it. Yep. 
So at the moment, the most I guess well-defined interface to um, the um, open gear device is SNMP. Um, we've got a pretty extensive MIB. However, having said that, we're currently developing a um, new central management, like a refreshing our central management solution, and all of that, all of that's going to be through RESTful API, and that's all going to be published and um, maintained and, and that kind of thing. So it's going to be an open API that other people can build on as well. And that would be that would be per device. You would need, I guess, the central controller. So all the interaction between the device and the central management right. uh, is, is broken by the API. So that means um, yeah, you can either control the device itself or you can go through the central management. Yeah. So you've got various points of integration depending on how big your install is. And that's coming, I guess, in the future? Or yep. So um, we anticipate it's early next year. It's going to be GA. So. Can you... You get root access to these boxes, correct? Yeah. So I guess it would be the service or stuff, can you redirect that other places, other scripts, maybe, yep. um, instead of going to, say, the web interface, have it, have some Python script that's listening? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, uh, one caveat is we don't have Python on the box itself. I actually just wrote this in Bash. So, um, yeah, but you can, um, you can uh, basically do as you said, we allow root access to our devices. You've even got like the CDK you can download. You can build your own firmware for these boxes to support our customers to do that. Like we're an open solution, um, and that's kind of core of what we do. You know, that's what we call over the year kind of thing. So, um, yeah, absolutely. You can uh, you kind of do what you want. We try and make it as functional out of the box as possible. Uh, it just you know, in terms of having a maintainable, sustainable solution. That's generally kind of what our, especially enterprise customers want. But in terms of um, making it, um, extending it, we've got some um, some pretty cool um, applications of you know people using it for uh, uh, security camera monitoring and all sorts of things. So it's all um, it's all extensive a lot of And are the GPIO things easily accessible through the web interface or? Uh, yep, and we got a little command line tool for driving and stuff. Yeah, so uh, this. Device I'm logged into doesn't have IO, oh, it's actually at IM7200. I'm using the demo, um, but yeah, yeah, and you can also drive um, uh, IOs in response to an auto response as well. So you could like sound an alarm or you know, flash a light or something like that. So we did that to um, our hardware manager, we set up a little ACM behind his door. So as he opened it, play a massive alarm inside here. <laughs> I did that personally, but the engineers in Australia did that.